Hello, welcome, uh, welcome to Kotzen Hall and uh, our uh, second uh, installment uh, of uh, this uh, semester's uh, series uh, on uh, cultural expressions of uh, Greece and Turkey, a program uh, that uh, was suggested uh, to us uh, by uh, Evangelia Balta, who has been very kind to share her knowledge uh, of things Ottoman and of people dealing with Ottoman things. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Uh, I, as uh, every time that we're here, I wanted to thank uh, Lloyd and Margit Kotzen for their generosity that allow us to uh, have lectures uh, from people who come uh, from far and near. Uh, in the case uh, of this uh, series, though, uh, we are fortunate enough uh, to have uh, more support from the Dovus uh, fu uh, Fund uh, and uh, also from uh, the Turkish uh, Embassy or the Embassy of Turkey uh, in Greece uh, and from the uh, Tourism Office uh, of, of Turkey. Uh, who is also providing uh, for uh, our uh, reception uh, afterwards. Uh, I thank you all uh, for uh, the support, uh, which uh, is uh, also a support of, of people uh, being uh, in this room. And I know how important this is uh, because uh, uh, you, you are with us, uh, not just mentally, but physically. Um, so tonight we are going to explore, I mean, the, the, a, a month ago we explored uh, television and film uh, and uh, the historical series about uh, in, in Greek and Turkish television and film. Uh, today uh, the topic uh, is uh, shadow theater. Uh, the title is History in Shadows, the Shadow Puppet Theaters as Conveyors of History. Uh, and uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, who have, uh, have uh, worked uh, on uh, Karagios, Karagiozi and uh, who will uh, try to uh, talk to us uh, in uh, a deep way uh, about uh, these uh, performances in, in their historical context. Uh, I, I have to say, and uh, although I don't know what Anna Stavrakopoulou will talk about, uh, just by reading her abstract, uh, that uh, for me, uh, Karagiozis uh, was something that uh, I didn't necessarily grow up with, grow up with, but uh, it was a fixture when I was growing up, uh, and uh, a fixture that uh, I always knew that uh, it came from Turkey. Uh, and uh, so I, I will be very interested to, to see how this plays out uh, and how the two sides uh, of, uh, of this uh, form of, uh, I guess we can call it entertainment, but of this uh, form, uh, this art form, how these uh, uh, ways of looking uh, at uh, Karagiozi uh, from the point of view of uh, a comparative literature person uh, and of a sociologist, uh, how this uh, too will inform us more uh, about uh, this particular uh, activity. I will not uh, say very much about uh, the, the two uh, speakers because you have uh, brief biographies of them uh, in, uh, in, in a handout. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. <clears throat> particularly to Granidius Library and uh, Turkish Embassy uh, to, give my imp to give me an opportunity to make a speech. <clears throat> uh, in Istanbul, the first cafe house was set up in 1554. At this cafe house, diverse groups of people uh, from all walks, of, all walks of life gathered and they built a different public sphere. Besides theatrical performances like shadow theater and storytelling, people met to have conversations uh, on diverse subjects from politics to everyday life. However, since the, middle, uh, since the middle of 20th century, 
The public sphere has been discussed among uh, Western scholars in line with the rationality of the public sphere. A great majority of scholars focused on the rationality of the public sphere. Moreover, as far as I know, no scholar has made any connection between shadow theater and a different perception of public sphere. My presentation will focus on this relationship. I also try to analyze the basic features of venues where Karagos was performed, as well as its, co its connection to the public sphere concept. First of all, we should, we should focus on the meaning of public sphere. What is public sphere? German thinker Jürgen Habermas claims that during the 18th century, bourgeois society created a domain between the state and the private areas. It is called public sphere. Educated and rich people came together in cafe houses and salons and debated art, social and political issues. First, the literary public sphere emerged and then with the contributions of the journals, the political public sphere came out. Debates were based upon the rationality and argumentative structure. There are many critics against this public sphere approach, but I do not want to discuss these criticisms. But to put it briefly, arguments about rational public sphere were based upon the rationality and universality of the Habermasian public sphere concept. Is it possible to reduce the public sphere only to its rationality? What about games, plays, gossip, humor, irony, and everyday life? What about other public spheres in different cultures, in different countries? Before discussing this question, we should have a look have a look at reason and affect dichotomy and the basic features of Karagos. The rational, the rational emotional dichotomy was imagined by Plato. Plato was against many arts because he believed that arts deluded people and misled them. Uh, you know the cave allegory. I argue that during the Ottoman Empire, shadow theater was providing a kind of freedom and emancipatory domain. People were watching shadow theater, participating in it, and thus understanding and feeling their oppositions and political life. Karagos, in this context, was demystifying the mystified world, using humor, satire, dialogue, conflicts and entertainment. Contrary to Plato's views, cave, which means coffee houses, and shadows, which means shadow theater, were real emancipatory domains. The venue where the Karagos play was performed and the content of Karagos provided a different kind of public sphere for ordinary people. I call this public sphere affective public sphere. Karagos, first of all, is a perfect example of plurality of perspectives and dialogical style. Because all characters are criticized and there is no ideal type. The conflict of utterances in the play, dialogue uh, and dialogue, can never be reconciled. There is no monological truth in the play. The conflict goes on throughout the performance. There is no fixed text or script of the performance. It has a fragmented, fragmented storyline. The puppeteer improvises the dialogue according to the mood and the venue where the Karagos performance was performed. Moreover, because of the spontaneity of Karagos, even though we know the basic pattern of the play, it is open to surprises and creativity. The surprise in Karagos, sometimes such an engrossing feature that regulars of venues cannot identify with Karagos, Karagos plays characters. 
they might alienate themselves from the from the play. In the blood of poplar, poplar play, for example, Karagöz sees the poplar. Karagöz sees the poplar, and uh, he asks he asks uh, Hajivat, who put this poplar on the curtain. Uh, Karagöz sees the poplar, and uh, at this point, uh, he uh, tries to make aware of the audience. They distract. They distract and distort, distort audience's perception from the story. In this performance, Karagöz also criticizes the curriculum of the play that follows the same uh, actions. In another play, The Sewing, uh, Hacivat reminds Karagöz that the half of the screen belongs to him and the half other belongs to Karagöz. They know that they are fictional characters, and this fact astonishes audience. They know that the, the drunkard baker, uh, on the other hand, yells out and breaks himself through the play of stupid watchman. That is why audiences expect him to punish the criminal in the final scene. This expectation does not come true when the drunkard says, uh, it is easy to get even with the one who acts in a bad manner, nevertheless to forgive one is the best way for a mature person. In the Karagos play, in fact, the dichotomy uh, of rationality and affectivity could be clearly be found. First of all, the basic characters, Karagos and Hajivat, re were representing this opposition. There are two main characters in the Karagos play. <clears throat> Hajivat and Karagos. Hajivat is a respected man of neighborhood. He is cultured, mannered, educated, and compromising, yet selfish, insincere, and insidious. He expresses himself in a Polish Ottoman language with plenty of Arabic and Persian words. He does not do manual labor. He is usually a broker or commission agent, and he often attempts to domesticate or patronize Karagos. He tries to teach Karagos mathematics, science, and art. Hajivat is a rational man in the play. He considers his every step and suppresses his emotions and accept, accepts the already existing order as well as adapting himself to that order uh, and noble ethics. Karagöz is opposite Karag Hajivat. Haj Karagöz is ignorant, uneducated, noble, uh, na naive, rude, simple, sincere, and immoral. He is also greedy, liar, subversive, and unsuccessful. Generally, he is unemployed. He takes jobs that Hajivat finds for him. Karagöz systematically misunderstands or seem to, seems to misunderstand uh, what Hajivat says or advises. He brings Hajivat's rational speech down to a bodily level. Everybody looks down upon him and he is always in trouble. But even the hardest conditions and times he never loses his gaiety, his joy. Karagöz is affective or emotional character in the play. He is impulsive. He acts affectively. Karagöz refuses any kind of uh, societal oppression. He is open to, soul, open, to, open to all sorts of new experiences. From the depiction of the two main characters, it is not difficult. It is not too difficult uh, to figure out who represents whom. Hajivat is a re representative of Ottoman high culture, a man of the ruling class. Karagöz, on the other hand, represents o o Ottoman ordinary man. In my opinion, the structural elements of affective public sphere in the Ottoman period are rooted in cafe houses and the content of Karagöz. Now I am going to delineate this issue. 
Imagine that we are living in a society where we cannot, main, we cannot find many socialization possibilities. There are few autonomous venues which are intermediary zones between the state and private area. Religious places such as mosques and churches mainly provide worship needs. In market areas, people would get together in daytime, not at night. A marketplace's main function is not to provide socialization for people, but to present things to people for buying and selling. Moreover, since marketplaces are open to everyone and not surrounded by walls, they are, they are easily open to political power's intervention. For political power to observe and monitor people is quite easy and practical there. Marketplaces and religious domains are not as autonomous as cafe houses. From the beginning, cafe houses were commercial venues where different people having a, having a variety of cultural backgrounds got together and socialized with each other. That cafe houses were mostly surrounded by walls and closed doors made them relatively autonomous. Moreover, ordinary people not only met there in the daytime, but also at night. On top of that, people neither came together at cafe houses with a specific duty or obligation or private issues. They just longed for talk, drink, fun, some performances like caregivers. It was an impossible task for political power to intervene all cafe houses because their number was, was huge in Istanbul. Besides, people who were addicted to getting uh, together around the cafe drinks could not abandon cafe houses, even if rulers banned them. At this juncture, it will be useful to talk about the other venues where Karagöz was performed. In which places was Karagöz performed other than cafe houses? Karagöz was not only performed at cafe houses, but also in palaces and rich family houses. During Ramadan, special, special Karagöz plays were performed, both inside and outside palace. But the puppeteer who performed a Karagöz play in front of the, the Sultan had to be careful, otherwise he would face a punishment. He could not utter a single wrong expression or obscene dialogue to, ma to make people laugh. Particularly, political matters were dangerous for a puppeteer at the palace. Therefore, he had to obey the strict rules on this issue. Puppeteers were immediately changing the band words when they remembered where they were performing. Other than palaces, in the rich family houses, after having dinner and right after prayers, the host entertained his guests with a Karagöz play. The most common and pervasive venue of, for Karagöz shows were cafe houses. These venues were unsurprisingly male places because the Ottoman Empire, like other countries, was a male-dominated society. Cafe houses were reflecting this society. Cafe houses were much more autonomous venues than palaces and rich family houses, both for Karagöz puppeteers and audiences. The spontaneous, messy, heterodox, authentic, genuine Karagöz could be encountered at cafe houses rather than other venues. Now I would like to analyze the term affect and make a connection between the t this term with affective public sphere in the Ottoman period. What is affect? A great majority of philosophers, including Plato, Descartes, Aristotle, Kant, and others, conceived affect as, as a potentially dangerous force. For them, as an aggressive force, affect tends to subvert rational mind thought and judgment as well as behaviors. As an exception, Spinoza, Hume, and Nietzsche perceived effect as a positive force, force for our minds. 
During the past years, the research in social cognition and neuroscience confirmed this view about affect. Affect, rather than having a dangerous and subversive effect on our behaviors and judgments, is often a beneficial force in decision making. <clears throat> affect is a manifestation of emotion, a particular mo mode of emotion. If I like a cafe house venue and regulars watching cafe Caragos performances, as well as the content of Caragos, I might show my feelings by different ways. I could smile, I could touch, I could yell out, I could laugh. These feelings are effect which shows our response to Caragos performances. It can be understood that neither reason nor effect is the determinant factor to produce thought. Both of them are in collaboration with each other. A human being is a complicated and ambiguous creature. He overcomes and he overcomes difficulties and deals with real problems if he applies both affect and reason. To claim rationality must take must take primacy over affect or emotion means the elimination of empathy and joy in our life. When we get into Caragos play, <clears throat> it can be seen that both these characters, Caragos and Hajivat, need each other. They show this desire by their utterances and behaviors. They cannot handle not seeing each other. Every night, Hajivat comes in front of Caragos' house and sings his own praise. Eventually, Caragos comes, comes down, and Hajivat says, I cannot stand without seeing you. Hajivat may come there for self-actualization and show himself off. Caragos is the only person who listens to his praise. Hajivat can only boast to Caragos. Caragos also needs Hajivat since he wants to express himself by humiliating, making irony, shouting, joking, beating, using slang words, and curse Hajivat. It is a path to self-actualization for Caragos in the play. These rational and affective characters complement each other. But nevertheless, throughout the play, Caragos is a dominant character for the regulars of the cafe house uh, audiences. Because of the Caragos hegemony, the play is called Caragos, not Hajivat. If elites and elite culture were in power, it was natural for ordinary people to perceive Caragos as a dominant and sympathetic character. Caragos was reversing and turning upside down the real world and creating alternative world. Regulars of cafe houses needed to connect with this alternative reality in order to escape from the real world and create their own world. Caragos plays embraced all, pe all people in the Ottoman period. Besides the Turks, we can find representatives of society from Jews to Armenian, Greeks to Albanians, Bosnians to Arabs, Persians and Georgians from all walk, all walk of life. A Greek finds himself on the screen as a doctor or an innkeeper, a Jew as a second-hand dealer, and malicious moneylender, and an Ar Armenian as a jeweler, serious and dull person, and a Turk as a woodcutter, and a slow-witted and rude person. The Arab is a rich coffee grinder or slave repeatedly asking the si same questions. Karagos curtain is similar to the mirror which reflects the society of the people, which reflects the people of Istanbul and events of, ta of the times. It makes everybody laugh and at the same time it is laugh at. The shadow theater is not in the hands of uh, a specific group. 
it caters to more than one class or interest. These features of the shadow theater makes it popular culture. Whether urbanite or peasant, Muslim or Christian or Jewish, poor or rich, everyone finds in Karagöz an element addressing himself or herself. Now, finally, I would like to touch the issue, political and obscene as aspects of Karagöz in order to concrete the subject, affective public sphere subject. As my colleague said, Karagöz was characterized by obscene and political humor, irony, and satire. This little guy, Karagöz, criticizes power. The performances of Karagöz were full of political satire. High officials and grand viziers were fair game. Karagöz was commonly employed as a political weapon to criticize political corruption. In 1855, Mary, a Western traveler, claimed that Karagöz was a daily newspaper without security, without stamp, without a responsible editor, a terrible newspaper because it, it cannot write, it talks and sings in front of its numerous subscribers. Traveler Gerard de Nerval clarified that Karagöz also represented the opposition. For him, Karagöz was always the representative of, of the folk who mocked the nobles or criticized the ruler mistakes. Another French traveler, Wanda, reported the criticism against high officials in Karagöz plays. In a play, a young man wants some advice from Karagöz on which profession he should choose. Karagöz replies, since you do not know anything, I advise you to become a chief admiral. <laughs> the young man becomes an admiral and attacks rats. The sultan rewards this admiral after this victory, marrying him to his daughter. Karagöz was, was also an obscene play. By obscenity, I do not want to claim that Karagöz was a pornographic uh, performance, it was not, no such a thing. Rather, it applied puns and phallus. At this point, Karagöz's sexually loaded puns themselves are revolutionary. Karagöz was mirroring and satirizing the indecent meetings of men and women, like in the play of Robot, in Turkish Kayık, and the bathhouse, in Turkish Hamam. Bathhouse was satirizing the notorious bath, uh, notorious bath houses in the Ottoman Empire. Karagöz's obscenity can, can be found not only in the report of Western travelers, uh, but also in the text written by Nazif Bey, a court, the last court puppeteer. Karagöz in this text utters words with sexual, sexual connotations. <clears throat> For example, to lift connotes the erection of the sexual organ. To perform connotes sexual performance. In the plot, the great wedding, uh, in Turkish, büyük evlenme, a prospective mother-in-law of Karagöz asks for hundreds of tra tra hundreds trays of Turkish cream called kaymak. Karagöz responds to Hajvat, the negotiator, saying, assure them not to worry about it. I can sleep day and night. In Turkish, to sleep and kaymak are homonymous words. They are both written and read the same in Turkish. However, sleeping is a ver verb meaning to make sex in slang. Karagöz was also full of irony and social satire other than political satire. For instance, Pilgrim de Fiz. Pilgrim de Fiz is a name for describing Arabs. White and black Arabs are criticized in ironic way. These titles give an idea that being a pilgrim for Arabs do not deserve a respect. On the, cont on the contrary, Karagöz mocks them. 
If a white Arab speaks very well, Karagöz says Amen. At the end of the Arab speech. Because the melodic line of the dialogue, he will, because of the melodic line of the dialogue, he would think that he is think, listening at he is listening to a prayer. This little guy thinks he, he is in religious ceremony, and therefore makes an irony with the person whom he talks with. It means elites or prayers cannot be sometimes understandable for many people, including Karagöz. As mentioned before, there was no ideal character at Karagöz. Therefore, social satire was directed towards every groups and characters in the play. There was no exception to this rule. That means Karagöz play cannot be evaluated from the normative standpoint. In the final scene, a pleasure, to, a pleasure trip to Yalova, in Turkish Yalova Sefası, Karagöz orders his dog to bite the nose of the edict, the ears of the white Arabs, the shoulders of Albania, Albanian, the back of the Armenian. The edict snores in the middle of any conversation. <clears throat> that is why the nose is the target for Karagöz. The, the white Arab either cannot understand or, if he does, misunderstand Karagöz. He even does not want to listen or hears Karagöz. His ears, therefore, are target to be bitten by dog. The Albanian, on the other hand, brags and squares his shoulders like this to show himself off. For Karagöz, the shoulders of the Albanian are salient and conspicuous. The Armenian has no sense of humor. He is very serious and focuses his job. Probably Karagöz thinks that he probably Karagöz thinks that Armenian talks to a brick wall. Since Armenian does not care Karagöz and others, the back of him is a place to be bitten. The regulars who witness uh, this scene might encounter their weakness and powerless sides as well as the facts. That every character and group face their weakness and powerless aspects means that they have so much power and they are so much strong. Why? Because there is no hero, there is no Superman like in Hollywood movies. Now that there is no hero, we should take on our responsibilities and deal with real problems. We cannot transfer our responsibilities to heroes. Coffee houses were intermediary zones between the Ottoman state and private domains. Likewise, Karagöz was a mediator between the rulers and the subjects of Sultan, as well as between Muslims and non-Muslims. Karagöz plays were a kind of media of lessening the tension and conflict among different classes and ethnic and religious groups. Even though different religious ethnic groups and classes could not communicate with each other in real life a lot, they could encounter with each other via Karagöz place at cafe houses. This play would soothe the prospective clashes among the religious and ethnic communities in the Ottoman Empire. Karagöz was derived from the everyday experiences uh, of the audience. It produced an alternative reality that was shaped according to the desire of the audience. This alternative reality was not rooted in the rational debate but rather from the affective venue, which means coffee house, and the affective perf performance, which means Karagöz. Karagöz in this context was the medium of affective public sphere, and the coffee house was the affective public sphere. Thank you very much.
try and have discussion. <laughs> So, uh, if, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank both of our speakers for giving us uh, wonderful presentations and for me at least uh, things that, I mean, I learned a lot and it sort of made me think about these performances as uh, something uh, that uh, had a very different kind of, of connection and, and, and uh, importance uh, in the societies where they were performed. And obviously, I think uh, what joins the two papers is, uh, is the fact that you know, they, they don't speak about the play itself, but so more about how the audience sort of uh, interplays with it. So uh, if we can have a few questions, uh, we can start. Can you wait for the mic? Thank you very much to both of you for wonderful talks. I have two questions for Professor Oztuk. The first is, do you know if Karagyo's plays were ever performed in Mehanes, in taverns? And I get the sense that they were not, and I'm wondering why, because that would seem to be a venue. Secondly, you had said that Karagyo's was a representative of the folk, of the people. And I'm wondering how you would position him to that other famous representative of the folk, I think, Nasreddin Hoja. Uh, I mean, in popular culture and in folk tradition, there are many characters. Nasreddin Hoca represents the people, common people. And, uh, you know, uh, there are many humor characters in Turkey as well. Uh, coffee houses are very important for the venue of for Karagöz because it provided an autonomous um, autonomous um, place for the for the audience and also for the puppeteers. This is a turning point. Uh, actually, in Memluk Sultanate, I mean before the before the Ottoman cafe houses, there were some performances, Karagöz and Hajivat uh, shows, but. In these performances, we could not see a neighborhood or uh, re real, real, real life. They, they, are, they are representing the abstract life, like metaphorical life. And also inside it, there were high, highly intellectual language, full of uh, Persian and Arabic language. And many people couldn't understand. And there, there was no political or social satire. Uh, but when it was transferred into the Ottoman Empire, first the palace. In the palace, uh, the, uh, the sultans were very enjoying when, when they witnessed the Karagos. But after the middle of the 16th, 16th century, yeah, the, after the setting up, Karag setting up uh, cafe houses, Karagos was transferred into cafe houses, and after that, we could uh, see the carnavalesque tradition, like, like Mihail Bakhtin said. Why? Because uh, people would feel uh, free uh, in the cafe houses, and uh, also they could uh, express themselves in a different way. And I believe that if cafe houses hadn't been uh, in the Ottoman Empire, we, could, uh, we wouldn't have talk about the uh, uh, affective public sphere or other uh, kind of term which describes the characters. I believe that. Could, could I interject a question of ignorance? Uh, is Karagöz still strong in Turkey or not? No. Sorry. Karagöz is not strong in Turkey because uh, because of the modernization efforts and also uh, also you know uh, new media, uh, television, cinema. Uh, people could not find an enjoyment enjoyment in the Karagöz, 
uh, life, you know, is going on, and Karagöz doesn't keep up with the real life. Uh, Karagöz form is old. Karagöz form is old. Uh, you know, I have a child who is 12 years old. When I talk about Karagöz, he's he's looking at me like this. What is what are you talking about? I mean, uh, who is Karagöz? What is Karagöz? So why? Because he is watching, you know, cartoons. He is addicted to watching cartoons. You can you cannot give up watching uh, cartoons if you if you are you know it is impossible to back return. Maybe you could both follow up a little on the, the last question and answer because Professor Stavrokopoulou said after the metapolitopsy, Cargiosi dies off. And I'm happy I was here before that because I laughed just thinking about them. And, and suggested that it was the intervention of mass media and things that has changed that. Did Cargos in Turkey start to decline with the establishment of the Republic, or was it a longer process? In other words, did Cargo's uh, theater in coffee houses continue after World War I, after uh, the 1920s? Uh, when did it really die off? And, and, and is there a comparison between the two? Yeah, it is, it is a very good question and difficult question. Uh, um, it is interesting because uh, before the 16th century, uh, as Mihail Bakhtin said, there was a carnivalex tradition in the Western world. In this, in this carnivalex tradition, people, people would express themselves by uh, eating uh, food or or performing sexual things, you know, sexuality and obscenity, and also uh, the uh, eating some things and uh, expressing themselves in a in a humorous way was common before the 16th century, and uh, after the 16th century, the Western world has lost this tradition. So this tradition uh, was, you know, passed into the Ottoman Empire. So Ottoman Empire and audiences got this tradition, uh, you know, Carnivalex tradition, and uh, they set up a different kind of affective public sphere until 19th century, I think, or maybe in the middle of until until the in the until maybe 20th century, I am not sure. 19, uh, because uh, 19th century, uh, because of the modernization efforts, um, some things have been sterilized, filtered. Uh, first, the steriliza sterilization starts, started uh, on the puppeteers. Puppeteers saw the real changes and uh, modernization efforts and they changed the Karagos place. And over time, Karagos place became like childish play, childish play. Uh, so people didn't care Karagos. Uh, I think modernization is the best responsible for mm -hmm. losing its meaning. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I can give an example. 19, in 1918, uh, the last court puppeteer, which I said a little before, Nazif Bey. Mm -hmm. Nazif Bey collected the Karagos place, wrote down, and by writing down, you know, he filtered many things. Mm -hmm. And obscene words were omitted. Uh, this, is the, this was the turning point, in my opinion. Um, yeah, um, on, on what's just been said. Um, one way of regarding the present interest in karyosis in Greece is a sort of artificial respiration. 
Um, that's to say, it's, it, is it the genuine object? Um, I compare it with China, where um, there's a great deal of interest from the state in reviving Chinese classical puppet theatre, which for a very long time was not, not culturally acceptable, should we say. Um, to uh, Professor Öztürk, um, I wondered, is there any record uh, of uh, Kimmel Atatürk attending a performance of Shadow Theatre or of passing any comment on this as a form? Uh, I don't have any record about this issue, but uh, I would like to say that during the, uh, during the first years of the during the early Republican period in Turkey, 1920s, 1930s, there was a kind of modernization efforts to uh, keep up uh, the Karagöz with the modernization. It was a didactic uh, revolution, didactic uh, changing. Uh, the uh, modernization leaders wanted Karagöz uh, to educate people, to educate people. But Karagöz was not an education tool. Um, so they thought, I mean, uh, their motivation was different. And actually, they wanted to keep alive the Karagöz. They wanted to keep. But uh, the, more they wanted, the more they wanted to keep alive Karagöz by giving some new elements, uh, the more Karagöz have lost its meaning. Uh, there is a paradoxical thing. I mean, yeah. I think maybe, unfortunately, the answer is that we're getting very old, Veronica. I mean, I think. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you very much all for uh, this uh, nice uh, sort of presentation and discussion which started and we can continue it uh, at uh, the reception. And again, thank you very much uh, to all who contributed for this uh, wonderful evening and of course to our two speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.